Courtney Brown, R. Uh, Brown, born 1939 in Detroit, Michigan, Trinity Hospital. Uh, born and raised in Detroit, I'm 72 now. Raised in what we call now, or what used to be called Black Bottom in Paradise Valley for the first 18 years of my life. It's very similar to what Rudolph and others said. It was a time when you were free and easy. You felt relatively safe. You were in your own neighborhood. Everybody went to the same school for years, from kindergarten all the way to high school. We saw black business. Now, Eddie's father was a very successful businessman. Uh, he's one of the few black. He couldn't sell liquor, but he had beer and wine license back then because it was during the war. And his father had lots of rental property. Uh, so his family would have been maybe kind of a step. He started, see, but back then, blacks, even though you had money, stayed in the neighborhood. It wasn't like they, you know, you live here and do business there. Everybody stayed in there because of how much money you had. The big, the number man. Yeah, I mean, they had little berries, but it was no stigma, you know, who had the money, who did not have the money. Eddie Fowler, remember, first bought a Lincoln Continental with push button windows, which was unheard of in 1947, 1948. Uh, we had a black, first black and only uh, auto major dealer, Ed Davis Studebaker, on Brush and Verner. Uh, you yeah, yeah. Didn't he also then get a Ford a Dexter later? That was later. Yeah, later. He got Chevrolet. Yeah. Chevrolet yeah. on Dexter. So you had black business like the Pelican restaurant. had three of them. You had the uh, you had uh, Ringside, Big Top, Tip Top was... Well, now we all call them, we call them Coney Islands. It was Hamburger and French fries joint, but it was known as black owned. You had the Gotham Hotel, you had the Carson Plaza, you had the Norwood, you had the Carver, all black owned hotels. So, I mean, along with probably, I guess, Harlem, it would have been the kind of the cat. Yeah, like Detroit, the Paradise Valley was considered like Watson, LA, Harlem in New York, south side of Chicago, uptown and south side of Philly. I don't know if it's better or not, but, I, but it, it was on the same level. I graduated there in 1957, last class to graduate out of Miller High School, which a lot of famous alumni came out of Miller. Um, I got a job with my stepfather at a packing house called K. Shapiro. So you were very young, or no, I'm saying my stepfather. And uh, I worked there seven years. I rose up through the rank from being so let regular labor to the president of the local. Uh, then I got married in 1961. My daughter was born that, later on that year, Christmas. My son was born three years, three days later, on the 28th of December, 1964. And uh, at that time, I had the plant closed. I worked at Chrysler for about a year, a year and a half. From there, I went to work for the state of Michigan as a boys' training school, as a boys' counselor. I uh, stayed there for approximately a year, and then I uh, transferred, not transferred, but I applied to start driving the bus at DSR, which I worked there five years. It was purely by accident or coincidence. Uh, I'll never forget it. Eddie had hurt himself, he had a car accident, and he had some insurance papers, and. He didn't understand how, what it meant, and he, but he only knew that his, he was allegedly supposed to pay him X amount of dollars if something. And he had, one day I stopped, he had, a, he had a little hustling thing he was doing after, he had what we call after hour joint, a little gambling thing, selling liquor and guys shooting dice and playing poker. So I would stop by there every now and then and kick the bobo with him and a few other friends. And he would tell me, he Courtney, uh, the insurance company won't pay me. So you got a pretty good understanding of the law of procedure. Why don't you read these papers and see? So it took a little while. So finally I read it. I said, yeah, they, they do owe you. I said, do you got a doctor? He said, yes. I said, all right. I said, I'm going to call the insurance company and say to them, I'm your brother. I'm representing you. And uh, we'll see. So he gave me the paper. I called the insurance company. And I told him, I said, one of their clients had had an accident with him. And they all said in the, an agreement that if they, 
If he was confined to his house, they would pay him $25 a day. And they said, yes, sir. And I said, well, do we have to sue y'all? And they said, no. They said, we'll bring Mr. Jackson in with an excuse from the doctor stating that he'd been confined to his house for the period of time, which we did when we got a doctor, Spain, took it out to the insurance company. And they gave him the, a little draft out for $3,800. He gave me $800. Then he, says, then he turns to me and says, Courtney. You know, he called me Courtney. Then he said, Courtney. Then he said, Bull. I'm going into drug business. I say, is you crazy? He said, no. I say, what do you know about drugs, Eddie? Nothing. He said, but they're doing something at the Flamingo Hotel, and every time the police come, they be throwing the guns and the drugs out the window. And for him, you can make a lot of money. I said, well, I'm gone. And he said, well, man, he said, I'm going to do, do this. So he took the money, and as Rudolph mentioned earlier, he first went down to Kentucky, bought some guns, then came back and set up a so-called drug business, which I don't see Eddie again for another couple of months. I comes back down there, and he tells me that the guys ran off with his money, and he broke again. Well, I filled his income tax out. So I filled his income tax out. He got, obviously got his tax refund. He went back in business again. So, uh, I, you know, again, I, a couple of months passed. I don't see him. I come back downtown. And he tells me, he say, uh, man, I'm broke again. He say, you got any money? I say, like what? He say, $50. I say, yeah, I got $50. So he said, uh, well, I'm going to try it again. I loaned him $50 going back to work. I don't, this is the latter part of 68, early part of 69. So I see him again, and maybe a week or two later, but he's doing so bad. But he says, I say, where's your brother, Elijah? He say, he's doing something. He said, but man, luck may be breaking. I said, what you mean? He said, there's a guy named George James and his wife named Maddie. I heard they're really good dope sellers. He said, I'm supposed to meet them up at the Terrain Hotel on John R. I said, yeah. He said, yeah. So I leave, so I don't, bang. Sure enough, when I come back again, six months later, I'm standing on, I see his brother standing on the corner by the pool room. I said, uh, where's your brother? He said, Eddie's driving his car. I said, what raggedy ass car you got? Yeah, and before I could get the raggedy ass car out, Eddie come flying around the corner in the 1969 red Cadillac convertible, brand new. And he t tells me, Burmy, get in the car. I said, I'm not getting in the car, it's stolen. And Lodger, his brother laughs and said, no, he just bought it at Coffee Cadillac for $6,900. I say, $6,900? He, yeah, he paid cash for it. And I get in the car. Eddie paid me the money that, uh, that he had loaned him earlier. He said, look here, bull. Pop always told me if I got some property to get with you because you're smart and buy some property. He said, you, can you find me some property? I said, yeah, I'll look at the paper and see. But meanwhile, we goes in the restaurant and get a hamburger, which was right next to the pool room. And he said, I'm supposed to meet this guy named Box. And I said, who's this guy named Box? He said, man, he said he knows some big guy. I said, he might. So we have conversations. The little short guy named Box comes into the restaurant. He said, that's him right there. First thing, Box said, man, give me a blow. I'm sick. And he said, man, you ain't done what you say. Man, don't worry about it, man, no big man. Don't worry about it. So he said, man, boo, you think he know anything? I said, you don't know. I said, he might. He said, I'll prove it to you. Give me a dime. He went to use the telephone. He said, yeah, my man say, bring you over to his house. He said, where you live at? He said, on Van Night. So Eddie looked at me. I looked at him. He said, who is this guy you talking about? John Claxton. And he said, you don't know him. He said, man, I do know him. Night Claxton, but we talking about the big drug dealer? Yeah. Man, and you, and you a junkie, and you don't? I know him. So, and he said, he said, get all your money together. So he looked at me, I looked at him, and I threw up my hand, and he might. So sure enough, he did know Claxton. He took Eddie out there, and Eddie came back with some, with some jive. But I had left though. But the accident. You're just, you're not involved. I mean, no. You're just, he's your buddy. Yeah, yeah, that's it. 
yeah, so first my encounter, like Charles, was with 1969, never forget it. I was downtown, and I had found a couple pieces of property, and I saw Eddie, Eddie told me, he followed me to my house. So I followed him to his house. He gave me some money, and he said, then the phone rang. He said, Bull, answer the phone for me. So I answered the phone. I said, some guy named John. He said, that's my man. That's my man. So he said, I'll be right back. He said, I'll be back in my half. And I said, he just bought a house in Palmer Park. cost $40,000. I said, man, ain't no nigga got $40,000. He said, yes, he is. He just bought a house in Palmer Park. He said, I'll be right back. He came about a half an hour, 45 minutes. He come back. I'm waiting at his house. He throws a pack on the table. I look at the pack. I think it's sugar flour. I say, what is that? He said, that's dope. I say, what? He said, that's dope. He said, taste it. I said, is you crazy? And I'm hearing about you get the habits and shit. I'm, you know, paranoid or something. He said, taste it. He tasted it. So I taste it. I say, man, a person pay you for this shit? He said, yeah. So uh, I said, oh, yeah. Then he called a guy named Harold and two other people's workers over. And as Rudolph stated earlier, they start capping up the jive. What we call jive heron. And I wonder what the hell is they doing? Did they have to get mixed first? He mixed it first. He mixed it first and sipped it. I'm still wondering what in the hell is he doing. still dominated the he heroin said, trade. He on it or something. I'm looking at him. Three what? And then he said, that's the mix. And that's, that's the dope. I mean, you sip them together and this, that, and the other. And you, so I'm, I'm fascinated by this. I ain't never seen nothing like this before. So I'm. I'm fascinated because I've never seen heroin or cocaine in my life. I'm 30 years old, I've never seen it. And he says, I said, what are they doing? He said, they're capping up these penny caps and they sell them for a dollar a piece. So I said, yeah, if you've done that, I'm not going to stop. I'm going back to work. I don't even think no more about it. I gave him the, the address to the property and he came back. I think maybe a month later, I came back and he said, I'm going to get the property on Hancock. And he tells me, he said, according to what I'm going to do is, I'm going to use it as a fake out. He said, I'm going to have the guys downstairs, the shooting gallery, keep the dope upstairs, and f fix up some of the apartments so they come and come, it'd be under construction. So I still didn't think no more about it. Maybe a week, two weeks passed by. I, I got intrigued by it. So I go see him. I say, Eddie, can I hang out uh, on Hancock? He said, yeah, if you want to. He said, better than that, he said, Berman, you 5-0? Y'all can stay upstairs then. That's when Rudolph say, and what you do is, when they ask for the dope, y'all drop it down there, and he bring y'all the money. And if they need, yeah, him, me, and Five O. And uh, so we, that's how we got started. So it was, it was you, Five O, and him? Yeah. Going yeah, yeah. It was, and the uh, brother, no, no, actually, Eddie, we actually just do the mix up. Because we didn't know how to mix the stuff up really very good. Then we learned how to gradually. But like I say, we would sell the penny caps downstairs, then we'd sell what we call weight then was like a gram or two grams, or eight balls, just about the largest amount we would sell. And, and uh, back then, about 50, we called $50 fame then, uh, $50 packs then. What amount Shit, equivalent about seven grams. Yeah, we call it a quarter. We call it a quarter spoon. And then those people would probably take it. They would take it, like, they would, like, we would, like, the wholesaler, they, then they would retail it. They would cap it up and sell it to their people's penny caps. And then, but it was already cut up. It was already cut up at that time. That's what he was getting, mainly from one person that was Claxton. And how much money was being made? Well, I remember distinctly why I so distinctly was. The first time we... <laughs> We made a thousand dollars. We thought we was hell of doing a hell of a thing, which we did not look minute now. And that was what sixty nine. That was sixty nine. The first time we ever made a thousand dollars in one day. That was a combination of the pills and the little weight that we were selling. Cause I remember Eddie. Eddie we used to always, we used to always laugh about it. And then Eddie, I went back to where I stayed about three months. I saved up them. So about $4,000, $4,500 saved up. I went on back to work and bought a house on Mark Twain. And I went on back to work today. I, 
for a whole year. Uh, I didn't see any of them. I didn't, I mean, finally, I think, uh, yeah, then, yeah, they're gone. I went on back to, went on back driving the bus. Later in the year 1970, Halloween, I don't know, I came to a crossroad in my life. I said, well, if I go back to work for the state or go back and hustle with Eddie and save up some more money and then, then go back to work. But anyway, I decided to go see Eddie. And I told Eddie, I said, I ain't got no job, man. He said, not you. I said, yeah, I said. He said, you always had a job. I said, yeah, but I think I, I just quit driving the bus. He didn't exchange nothing with me. He said, uh, all right. He said, you lucky. He said, because I'm getting ready to go hunting with Big Willie and my brother. We're going bear hunting in Lodge. He said, you can help Rudolph, Fiavo, and Russell, and Fairlee mix up. And I was behind in my house note and all that. And he said, oh, don't worry about it. I'll straighten it when I get back. So this was 19, November 1970. So he come back, he give me the money, I straightened up the thing. Something very freak happened in the end of 1970. Eddie was inconsistent with John Clack because he had got violated on some state case he had. And the drugs was coming inconsistent. But we were still doing what we were doing. I don't know, because when I came back in 1970, I would say five colors. Well, I remember that because he, he had me go pick up the money one night. He, he had moved off of Hancock. He was on a nursery called Leland. And I know I picked up about $5,000 that night. That's, I don't know what they picked up during the day. This, this is before the raid came where you guys put the, the, the bad dope No, that was after. Okay, can you tell me? I mean, that was after, that this came before. The, uh, the raid on oh, Hubbard. Okay, so they went. No, no, not the raid on Hubbard. Raid on Hancock. Raid on that was before. Hancock. What happened was, that happened in, it had to be 71. Oh, okay, so that's, it happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so right now we're in December of 1970. In 1970, something came and said, I, I had to say, man, I got to make a choice. Either I'm going to work or I'm going to try working out with Eddie and save me enough money, then I'd go back to work then. Because I had the still driving, but I hadn't officially quit. I told them I was on injury leave. And then I had reapplied to the state, and they, re they recertified me, so I could go back and work for the state. Uh, December come along, they did just granted Ali his license back to fight. And it, the buzz was everybody's going to New York. A guy named Devil was... Uh, at the time, associated with Eddie, then he was halfway pimp, halfway hustler. He knew, yeah, he knew he was tight with uh, Mazette. And he would have, uh, he would have, uh, uh, he would have uh, riled Eddie up. He would say, Mazette got more money than Eddie got. And Eddie was always, he ain't got more money, I got to tell him what. He was mid-level. He still wasn't good because Mazet, you had Mazet, you had Adolf, you had oh, Lafayette. Uh, Not him. They were all the floor. No, they were more about Adolf Ellington. Uh, it, 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 most of them was selling weight. Eddie was still doing what we call mixed jab commercial stuff. Was, was Mazet considered the biggest guy? At that, no, Claxton was considered the biggest guy. Mazet had the name, but actually Claxton was the guy who really had the weight. Oh, so Claxton was the biggest. Yeah. Black but yeah, yeah, but at that time Claxton was getting it out because he had a state case. And he would, you know, get violated three or four months or whatever it is, and he'd leave it with his wife and uh Pretty Rick was fooling around with it, so it it became kind of shaky. Was Marzette getting stuff from Claxton? No, no, he wasn't getting, Claxton was his own man. Claxton had met a connect out in Oak Park, some Italians. Uh, what, you know, but, but he, he was getting some of the best dope in the city. No question about it, second to none. Claxton got something definitely between Claxton and Marzette. Marzette was the first one. Sam the mustache marker, yeah, that's what we heard. Yeah, yeah, he had, because, we knew he got to connect out there at the pool room. Mm -hmm. But he, he, he's getting to, 
because, mm -hmm. but I said, so, well, Norbert we. Norbert worked for the Italians. Yeah, Norbert was the intermediary for the Italians to file. Yeah, because we didn't pay. Uh, because the Jewish guy owned that pool room out there, you no know, park at the time. Oh, and Q, yeah, we were back in Q. Yeah. That when, that's when uh, Inkster Jones and all those who got there in Gamble. Right. We know where he got to connect from, who we actually were dealing with. And, but the quality did it because when he was getting in, we were putting a 30 on it for what we call mixed jive. Right. So we know he's getting a pretty good grade of, of, of stuff. That was Eddie, that's how Eddie was able to zoom off. Into the fight. But anyway, in, in 71, 80, say, I'm going to the fight. Which fight was that? Ali phrase the first fight. So at this point, you would say Eddie's big, but not one. No, of no, no, no. Now, he had already been, he had bought, no, they had, 71, he hadn't bought the Rolls Royce yet. Uh, he, was, he was, you know, doing, doing, we were doing pretty good. We were doing five, six, seven thousand dollars a day. So, Eddie told me he wants to go to the fight, you know, this, that, and the other. And, and, but anyway, he called the crew together and said, well, who want to go? 5-0 went, Big Willie. I don't think you and I stayed here. Yeah, we stayed there. I didn't want, I didn't want to go to the fight. We saw a close circuit. You know, that, was first, that was the first fight that George Foreman fought, his first professional fight after winning the Olympics. So uh, anyway, when Eddie goes to the fight, he goes dressed all up and drives his Fleetwood and bang to the fight. And he comes back. This is February, I think, after the fight. And he called me. He said, Birmingham, I want to talk to you. I said, yeah, all right. So we meet. He said, look here, man. I met some Italians, and they say they they letting the stuff go for 16000 a key. He asked me, he said, what do you think? I said, Eddie, you know more than I know. He said, well, I'll tell you what, we're going to send Dolph up there with 50,000 and get three keys. That's when I called you up. You came over to my house on Mark Twain. I gave you the $50,000. You flew in, flew back on in, handed back to him. And I don't know if you remember, not Dolph. Remember Eddie asked you, I was being that, no, tested or something. No, no, that was after the fact. That was after. But anyway, we started dealing like that. Either you would go, uh, Black Bush was not around then. Black, uh, so we started, you know, every couple of weeks or month, we would make a trip up to New York and cop and come on back. So first load comes in with three keys. Yeah. And what, how did that take you guys to another level? Well, uh, well, what happened, we still was doing commercial. After the second time we went and copped again, that's when Eddie had to meet with Big Willie, Kilpatrick. And he says, Bull, man, Willie said, man, we can make more money selling wheat than rain. We got all these problems. I said, well, that's up to you, Eddie. He said, well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to think about it. Meanwhile, his brother died. And we'll be still doing commercials, still selling street stuff. And is this so, just to clarify something, what, tell us the story about you knew a raid was coming on Hancock because you got tipped off. Oh, well, what happened was it was a couple of people that Eddie was paying off. Police. They approached Eddie and told him, said, look here, man. Police. Y'all heat. Police said, uh, we get word that they're going to raid because they heard there's a big dope house on Hancock and says, uh, they heard you pretty big or something. They say, Hear what you do. Leave a few packs. Have the workers do anything can find it. Say if they find it and you diluted it, and saying they may get off your trail because they figure you ain't nobody big. You not you just another guy in the, in the streets. So we told the guys to leave a few packs and make sure the police found it. They gonna have TV cameras and all this. So sure enough, they raided that night. Well, a couple of days later. Eddie uh, showed up, they find the, the few packs that we left around. And the workers were seen they were just junkies, let them go. And they, sh and they worked. They came back and said, no, the guy ain't what we, they say he is. He ain't nobody. He's just another one of them street level guys. Okay, so now we're back. So you start getting the dope from the Italians. Yeah. 
So I'm going to go, that's when, after his brother died, Eddie, for some reason after that, he came back and said, look here, I want everybody to meet at Courtney's house on Mark Twain. And, he, and I didn't know what he was going to say. And he said, look here, I'm through with the mixed business. In the building at this point, he had gotten up to doing 10 or 10 or 15 years. Yeah, I'm down there. Yeah. Can you give me a second? Yeah. Well, at that time, on the average, we was doing ten thousand dollars a day. On some on the weekend, we do fifteen thousand. This is in nineteen seventy. That's a lot. Of money. In nineteen seventy one. That's a lot of money. Yeah, back then. New, what did the new cabin cost? Six thousand. Six thousand. New fleet would cost ninety seven hundred, ninety seven hundred. So he calls a meeting. Uh, like I say again, Russell, Clayton, not Russell Clayton, Russell, Charles Rudolph, Ronald Garrett. And myself and Eddie meet in my kitchen. Eddie announced that he's getting out of the, that part of the business. Y'all can have it. Y'all can put it, put it up among yourself or you know, whatever y'all want to do. You can be your own boss. He says, the only person got a choice in this is Courtney. He can stay with me or he can be his own boss. And I can understand that. He said, plus, y'all been good law workers. I'm going to give each one of y'all $10,000 a piece. And since his brother died, he gave Rudolph his old Cadillac, which was one of the year old, 1970 Cadillac. He gave the new Cadillac, which his brother had just bought a 1971 Fleetwood to 50. Russell had already bought a Cadillac. I hadn't bought a car yet. And he said, Well, you burn you and you when you get ready. So that's what happened. He leaves. Rudolph, 50, and myself discussed and said, What you gonna do? I said, I think I'm gonna stay with Eddie. They say, well, we're going to continue the business. And Eddie said, well, y'all can buy the dope from me, or you can buy it from anybody y'all want to buy it from. Y'all free to do what y'all want to do. The business is y'all. As of Monday, I'm through with it. He got up and left. They decided, I told them at the meeting that I'm going to stay with Eddie. And uh, we had a discussion about it and debated about it. And I said, no, my decision is final. I'm going to go with Eddie. Y'all can have the business. Are you? And that's what happened. So, um, tell us how the whole operation from the from when somebody came on a plane or in the car and arrived in Detroit with the, with the dope from New York. How did it go from hey the baggage touchdown? To well, what we, we do is we always pre-plan planes. If we gonna decide to who house we was gonna use. Since we had diversified peoples and many friends that we grew up with, and then anybody looking for some extra money, we would decide if the dope would one day maybe over Donald's house, one day maybe over Dave's house, one day maybe over Priscilla's house. We would already know already. We would have all the equipment to mix the, the paraphernalia at that particular place. Uh, but then we would package it up, we'd weigh it. We didn't know where we, we, we would measure it. And Eddie had a formula of making a kilo or whatever he doing. And he said, well, look here, we're going to cut it 15 times. So one kilo makes 15. Yeah, we make 15 kilos. He would say, we're going to measure Burmese. they take out 20 quart. Now, what we would do, we would measure if the kilo came in, two pounds, two ounces, whatever. But we didn't weigh it. We measured it with a quarter spoon. So sometimes we get 100, I mean, 200, 300 spoons. We'll take 25 of those spoons and make a kilo out of it. And the rest of it's cut. The rest of it's cut. And then we would test that commercially and see what it would take in the streets. So we could still cut it. Yeah, with that, we, we still could put a 25 or a 30 on it for a street and distribution. Were, how were you selling it? Mostly in keys, ounces? Keys, mostly keys. Now, Eddie would, like Rudolph had mentioned earlier, Eddie had the uncanny ability to inspire people. And he started, most of the guys all who was doing commercial stuff to start buying wheat. And they do their own thing. He would say, uh, look here, man, here's a couple ounces. And then after that, he'd say, you, you ain't no half ounce person. You a, you're a half a kilo man here. Nineteen seventy three, the Detroit Free Press's front page proclaims dope kingpins get away with it. They had names like Jesse James, Pretty Ricky, The Black Greek, and Mr. Clean. 
Two of the 12 men listed as Detroit's biggest heroin dealers were next door neighbors. And in reality, they were the two largest heroin dealers in Detroit, dwarfing the other men on the list. Got 12 kilos. We gonna cut it 10 times at a minimum. So it would have been 120 kilos. The audience needs to understand the significance of black entrepreneurship. Customer give me the money, put the money through a chute in the door. They would drop the dope down right in front of the door. And everybody was getting money. Everybody was getting money that time. Always bags of money coming and going in the house. Almost to the ceiling, just a room full of money stacked to the ceiling. Eddie had shot past everybody in the city, put together. The gentleman gangster. You meet the right people, make the right connections, to make everyone happy, and do it all without having to really brandish a gun. Nicky Bond, snitch. Frank Lucas, snitch. Where's the real ones? I said, give me the pistol. And I said, I should blow your goddamn brains out right now. The 750 murders last year was a record for Detroit, murder capital of the country. This is a story about a real one. From the beginning to the end, never telling on nobody. Eddie the Fat Man Jackson, charismatic son of a pool hall owner, and his chief lieutenant, Courtney the Field Marshal Brown, a former city bus driver, had built an empire on a par with men like Nicky Barnes and Frank Lucas of New York. But theirs was a very different and in many ways more sophisticated operation than Barnes and Lucas's, based on family ties and finesse more than murder and mayhem. I went into that foolishness. It was business to me. He kept it so separate and he's my Little League baseball coach. Family came first. He would keep a pistol at the bottom of the Halloween bag. Boom, 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 boom. I'm going to shoot you right down. We had guys working three shifts. They were just like they worked before it. We, we paid vacation. They worked eight hours a day. They got paid for overtime. And we had a bunch of law workers. OK, I'm going to take 250 people. I got a million to blow. We all going to go down here and blow this million together. Throwing money out of the car, down in the Brewster Project. Me and Eddie used to buy two and three keys of cocaine just for our personal. The entertainers wanted to take pictures with, with the likes of those men like Eddie Jackson. You name them, we served them. Richard Pryor, the Dale, the OJ. It's just a couple of old white guys sitting around a desk with a whole bunch of people bringing them money in. And what they were doing were, they were money launderers. You know, you ask yourself questions like tobacco. How many people died last year from tobacco? When we started talking about the moral value of what Eddie Jackson and others do. I'm not condoning what they do. What I'm simply saying is that there are many on that playing field. People from Israel, there's some people from South America, there's some people from West Africa, and then it's myself. Everybody in the city knew Eddie Jackson. And everybody knew he was on top of the pyramid. I was his right-hand man. 